Hello, my most amazing scholars of truth, goodness, and beauty. How are you today? I'm happy to be here with your 3G art history video. And today we are going to continue the idea of light and shadow, but we are going to use a modern painting for our inspiration. So instead of working on studying some more Vermeer or um, Rembrandt, we're going to jump ahead a couple hundred years and we're gonna study a painting from the 1900s. And this is a painting called Ruby Green Singing. And it is beautiful. Definitely one of my favorites. All right, I'm gonna show it to you now. Let's take a look. She stands alone, bathed in a sunlit glow, her eyes lifted heavenward, her hands gently clasped in front of her pink satin dress. Her hair is cut like a flapper's, short and pert, and her face has the rounded innocence of a cherub. Her name is Ruby, and she is singing a song to God. For dozens of years, visitors have trooped through the Norton Museum of Art on their way to gawk at the famous Gauguin or Picasso's or O'Keeffe's when they stop short at a simple oil portrait by James Chapin called Ruby Green Singing. And just like that, they fall in love. Ruby may be the most popular portrait in the West Palm Beach Museum. She's a real crowd pleaser. Adults love her, children love her. Recently, a visitor came all the way from New York because her mother and father had met in front of that painting 40 years ago. Norton curator, Jonathan Stolman, still remembers the friendly advice of his predecessor. Whatever you do, don't ever take Ruby's picture down. It's a very beautiful, very soulful painting, says Stuhlman, who curates the American art collection. It touches people's hearts. But who was Ruby Green? What was she singing that gave her such a feeling? And more important, what happened to her? Ruby May Green was born on July 28, 1909 in Savannah, Georgia the eldest child of Edward and Amanda Green. She had six siblings, including one brother who died young. Her early family life wasn't easy, according to her nephew, Harry M. Gold Jr., a former reporter who listened carefully to her stories and loved Aunt Ruby like a second mother. Ruby's parents divorced when she was young and her mother moved the children briefly to Charleston, South Carolina in 1916, and they headed to Harlem, probably part of the historic Northern migration of African Americans looking for better jobs and opportunity. Amanda Green was a domestic who cleaned and maintained houses. Times were tough. She was struggling to make ends meet. Poverty forced her to make a heart-wrenching decision. For five years, she put Ruby and her sisters, Julia and Adrina, in the Good Samaritan Orphan Home in nearby Newark, New Jersey. But it was there, separated from half of her family, that Ruby found her future. Her nephew says she met a music teacher in the orphanage and learned to develop her voice and play piano. When she left the home around age 14, her distinctive singing immediately became noticed in the tight-knit circle of black churches in Harlem. She was a contralto, the lowest register of female voices, a type of vocal style popularized by the famous Marian Anderson. Ruby became the youngest contralto soloist at St. Mark's Church in Harlem and was soon in demand at other churches. Instructed by her mother, Ruby was deeply religious from an early age. She had a very definite moral outlook, says Gold. She was a straight and narrow girl. She was not a party girl. She was raised in a strict traditional black church by the scriptures. In 1928, the year her life changed forever, Ruby was 19 years old. The stock market was a year away from crashing. The cultural party known as the Harlem Renaissance was still in swing. 
Ruby was a member of the Hall Johnson Choir, a spirituals group led by a pioneering black violinist and Broadway musician who had migrated north from Georgia like the Greens. One day, an up-and-coming New Jersey painter saw Johnson and his cho chorus performing. He was impressed, calling them perhaps the finest group of spiritual singers we have. He was the man who would make Ruby famous. We think that James Chapin met Ruby in a church. He inquired who she was and asked Ruby if she would mind having her portrait done. Ruby talked little about the creation of the painting. So many tantalizing questions must go unanswered. Where was it painted? How long did it take? How did Chapin capture that spiritual pose? What was she singing? It's not even known if she saw the finished product in person. Later on, she never made a fuss about it. By October 1930, at age 21, Ruby had moved on, enrolling in the Institute of Musical Art, later known as the famed Juilliard School of Music in New York City. Records show that she had a high school degree upon entering and that she received a diploma in singing on June 2, 1933. While Ruby was preparing for Juilliard, her portrait was making waves on the New York art scene. In 1928, the painting went to Chapin's New York dealer, Frank Wren, who quickly sold it to Paul Sachs, the director of Harvard's Fogg Art Museum, for his personal collection. Ruby went on to have a wonderful singing career. She was mostly known for being a part of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, the world-renowned black choral group founded at Tennessee's Fisk University in the late 1800s. The Fisk Singers were the first to bring spirituals and slave songs to American and European audiences without a hint of the minstrel act. A 1945 program with the singers shows Ruby performing everything from Strauss to the old spiritual, Nobody Knows the Trouble I See. Ruby went on for many decades to sing with famous people, to record songs, to even perform on Broadway. But here is our question for today. What song was Ruby singing back in 1928 when this portrait was painted? I wish I knew. I like to just look at it and imagine she's singing one of my favorite songs. Maybe she's singing one of your favorite songs. She did have a favorite hymn, one that her friends and family often heard. Maybe it's that one. We won't know, but we can enjoy looking at her portrait. And today, as we gaze at this beautiful image, I want you to focus on the idea of light and shadow. Notice where the highlights are, how it makes her, her dress look very satiny. Check out these shadows on the left side. So this time, can you figure out where the light source is coming from? The light source is coming from the upper right corner this time and the shadows are on the left side. You can see the dark shadow because she has her chin uplifted. You can see the very dark shadow on the side of her arm. You can see the bright highlight on the front of her face. Ah, I don't know. There's just something magical about this painting. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Ruby Green. I wish we could hear her voice along with seeing her image in this portrait. I bet it was beautiful. All right, class, I need you to respond to this activity by answering this question. What activity was Ruby Green doing in her portrait? All right, be on the lookout for all things B-E-A-U-tiful.